Before we speak in Iraq, we pray God's blessing on all of us in Aramaic. It's a good language. It's not as bizarre as Welsh. <laughs> Having spent the last few days in Wales, I didn't understand the word of what they were saying. So, Aramaic. It's good language because Jesus spoke it. And if he did, it must be right. So, Shalubaba, Brona, Brocha, Kora, Halaha, Alohomaana, Messiah, come, come, come. Amen. We offer our time in the name of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because the Lord is here, his Spirit is with us. And then the special Easter words at the end, Messiah, come, come, come. The Lord is risen, risen, risen. So we always say, Messiah, come, come, come. So you do it now. Messiah, come. <coughs> we are meeting in the real power of the risen Lord. And I come to you tonight representing our church in the Middle East, in Iraq and Jordan, where all of our refugees are from Iraq. These are my people. I love them so intimately. And you know what? They're your people as well. We are one family in Yeshua. We say Yeshua, which is Aramaic for Jesus. You've probably heard of Yeshua Hebrew for Jesus. We say Yeshua. And so Yeshua is at the very heart of everything we do, say, and believe. It's very interesting. A major part of my work is in Israel. And in Israel, do you know what the name of God is? Don't say anything beginning with Y or J. What is the name of God? What is the name of God? The name of God is simply Ha Shem. Ha Shem. And that means the name. And we know that at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. I'm greatly honoured to be here tonight because for a strange reason, well it's not strange, Hereford is very significant to my life. I've never been here apart from when, when um, Bishop Anthony Priddis was installed as uh, bishop. I've never been here. But there are two people who are very important in my life. The first is the former bishop of Hereford, Bishop Anthony Priddis. Are you here, Bishop? A hand is waving just there. 
Bishop Anthony is the one who got me into this job. If you can imagine, I was too young to be a canon, two months too young, but they appointed me to the role of director of the International Centre for Reconciliation. He, I was talking to Bishop Anthony today and he did quite well in his appointments. He appointed me and then Justin Welby. <laughs> so he chose well. The other person who is very key is a lady from Hereford called Christine Dahl. Are you here, Christine? There she is. And where's your husband, Peter? These are the two people, the only two people that I know who really share in our kind of work in Israel and the Jewish and Arab areas. They are odd. They're like me. And they love both Arabs and Jews. And that's so important. And there are both these people in Hereford. And so God is doing something very important in this place and through this place. And I would not be doing what I'm doing now if it were not for this place. Now, I have this wonderful church in Baghdad. And when I got the church going, got going very well, we used to have six and a half thousand people in the church. And I used to do the young people's meetings on Friday night and they'd all be sitting down like those two boys over there playing at their machines. <laughs> Your game, what are they called? What? I, I pause. If you stop, you can have one of my pens. <laughs> Would you like one of my pens? They're good pens, see? Not many pens have got lights on. What's your name? Sorry? Ash. Ash. Ashley. Ash, come and get a pen. You know, before I was a vicar, I was a doctor. So if I had one of these, I could say, open the mouth, say, ah! They're very good at that. Here we are. Thank you. Now, the big, having just come from Liverpool, there was a big question. Is it a blue one or a red one? And that's a blue one. Does your friend want a red one? Would you like a blue one or a red one? Yes, put it down. <laughs> blue or red? Ah. Uh... <laughs> What's your name? Traven. 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 I can't hear. Travis. Travis. Travis and Ashley. You're really good. I like you two. <laughs> You're just like my people back home in Baghdad. Whenever you are trying to talk to them, they're playing on their machines. <laughs> and that's what you do, isn't it? I phoned my boy at night, what are you doing? Oh, I'm on my PlayStation. 
But now he started trying to be a bit holy. I'm on my iPod reading Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> so go on to your iPod and read Genesis chapter 3. Yeah. Bye, my friend. I'll see you in a minute. I went to, um, I was in Newtown in that other little country next to you <laughs> where they all speak funny and I was doing a religious studies class there and I said to all the students what do you think about God? There were 13 students in the class and they all said we don't believe in him. Oh, it has nothing to do with us. They said, they're atheists really. I said, liar! You haven't got enough faith to be an atheist. It takes a lot of faith not to believe. I can assure you that I have spent lots of time with people who are on the way out of this life and I've never found an atheist yet. You see, when you're on your way out, aren't they good pens? <laughs> They're really good, aren't they? They're good. I'm pleased you like them. They're better than those Star Wars things. <laughs> when I was the younger than those children, my teacher asked me at school, she asked all of us children, what do you want to do when you grow up? So they said footballers and truck drivers and all those bizarre things. She said, what do you want to do, Andrew? I said, I want to be an anaesthetist and a priest. She said to me, you can't. You can't do two things, you can only do one. And she said, you can't be a priest anyway because you're Pentecostal <laughs> and they don't have priests. So, I went to school, I did my A-levels and then I went to medical school and I trained to be I did surgery and anaesthetics and I was finally a gas man <laughs> so I can put you to sleep with drugs or sermons <laughs> sermons tend to be a lot slower than drugs One day, there I was at St. Thomas's Hospital in, Lo in London, where I trained. And I had given up the idea about being a priest then. I was so enjoying my life. I run the cardiac arrest team. And the problem was, they weren't very well planned out as regards timing. You know, you couldn't say we'll have one cardiac arrest at two and one at six and one at nine. They just kind of came and went and came and went. So I was in between cardiac arrest one day, thanking God so much for getting me to this wonderful hospital. And I was thanking him and thanking him. And then I remembered, in your prayer, 
when you're thanking God or saying anything to God, you need to ask God, what next? Say, what next, Lord? He said, into the church. I said, what do you mean, Lord? He said, I want you to go into the Anglican church. I said, God, they're not even all saved. <laughs> he said, I know, that's why I'm sending you there. <laughs> so, I started my journey off to the Vicar factory. I went to Cambridge did my Christian theology. I don't know, well, all the clergy have obviously studied Christian theology. It was so boring. <laughs> it was the most boring thing ever. So I thought I'd do a more relevant course. So I did the worship course. Somebody told me here this evening they're studying worship. Well, when I studied worship, as I'm sure some of you as well, I studied for two terms the Order of Hippolytus. Who knows about the Order of Hippolytus? None of the clergy even know about the Order of Hippolytus. Doesn't surprise me. I didn't know at the end either. <laughs> so I did that. And then I decided to specialize in Judaism. I was a member of the synagogue. Believe it or not, I belonged to the JSOC, the Jewish Society. And every Friday night we used to go along there and eat gefilte fish and do things the Jewish way. And so I did my doctorate on the role of Israel in Christian theology. And then I did another one on the role of the Baal Shem Tov in the Haskalah. None of you know what that means because it's Yiddish. And when my son was going to Cambridge, he's in his final year now, I said to J Josiah, I said to Yossi, I said, will you go to the JSOC, please? He, he said, yeah, I've got Jewish friends, but it's not like when you were there. I said, why not? He said, the JSOC now is booze for Jews. <laughs> so he wouldn't go to booze for Jews. And... Um, he was doing Mandarin, Chinese language, and he changed to divinity. He had a place, he was doing a training scheme with MI5, but after he switched to divinity, they didn't want him. So, he's going to be a teacher. How many teachers here? A lot. It's so important, teaching. Because teaching is laying the foundation for what is to come. I love being with children like Ashley even when he's not looking at chapter 3 of Genesis like he's supposed to be. It doesn't matter. The thing is that it's really important for young people to be where the Word of God is proclaimed. I don't mean boring preaching. Do you know, if I was a child, one of the reasons I wanted to go into the church was because I was so bored sitting in the pew. The preachers were so boring, I thought if I got there, 
then if it's boring, it's my fault. So if you're falling asleep and it's boring, let me know, okay? I was standing outside Coventry Cathedral one day and it was a place where I worked and lived and the bishop once said to me, I think you're the least residentiary, residentiary canon in the country because you're paid not to be here because I was going around the world dealing with the bad guys and I really felt that God wanted me to go to Iraq so I tried every way to get into Iraq and I failed they said we don't want you just stop dropping the bombs I said well I'm actually a clergyman I'm not a bomb dropper. I haven't got to that stage yet. <laughs> the last thing I did, I brought my staff together and we prayed, Lord, help us get into Iraq. And the next day I had a fax from Tarakaziz. Do you remember when we had faxes before emails and these old bits of papers that come out <laughs> well one of those and it said Tariq Aziz wants to see you in his office next Thursday at five o'clock now going into Iraq was really bizarre Nobody was allowed in. There was no fly zone, there were huge sanctions. And with God's help, I managed to get in. You know, not being an American, we're not used to 16 hour car journeys like the Americans. The Americans, they've got a lot going for them. They can cope with long journeys. I can't. So five days after the invite, I had a 16 hour drive from Amman to Baghdad. And that was the beginning of my engagement with Iraq. And it was just the beginning. So much happened in the years following. I never forget one day, anybody speak Arabic here? No? Well the Mohabratna, which is a spy who watches you all the time. He said to me one day, you've got a really important meeting today the most important ever. I said, I've been with Tarek Aziz all morning. Saddam doesn't see anybody. Who am I going to see? He wouldn't tell me. I said to him, is it the son? The son of Saddam, Uday and Gwazay. I said, which one is it? He said, no, it's really important. It's both of them. I said, I'm not going. I don't want to see them. He started to cry. He said, if you don't go, they will kill me and my family. So I went to the most unpleasant dinner party of my life. For hours, just listening to these two. A few weeks later, they were shot dead. But it was very difficult. 
And then we were in Baghdad in the years before the 203 war, the church was not open. Church closed in 1990. The only sign of life in the church was dead pigeons. And even they weren't very alive. <laughs> but they had been. So we got the church going. I never forget. It was actually with Archbishop Justin Welby and myself. We opened the church together. And within first week there was 100 people, second week 200, third week 300, fourth week 400. I thought, this is quite a good growth rate. <laughs> you know, having a church growing 100 a week was fairly good. And then we started to try and meet the needs of the people, so we got a clinic together, a dentist, we started a school. One day the Grand Ayatollah called me round, he said, Abuna Andrew, Abuna means father. Abuna Andrew said, we need some food for our people. I said, I've got $12 left in my pocket. How much food do you need? He said, for everybody, the whole country. That night I was looking out of the Palestine Hotel over the Tigris River and I saw a huge cloud in the sky and it looked like the glory cloud. And I said, God, what is this? And he said to me very clearly, read the book of Ezekiel. He didn't tell me it had 48 chapters. <laughs> So it took a little while to read it all. I read it all, and I read about how Ezekiel had seen the glory of the Lord. And I read about how he had prayed face down for wheat by the Kebar River. So I said to my colleagues, my Iraqi colleagues, I want to go to Ezekiel's shrine. His tomb is somewhere near Babylon. So I said, do any of you know where it, what, where it is? Nobody had a clue. Fortunately, internet had just started in Iraq. So I looked it up on Google <laughs> and found out it was in El Kifl. And I went down there to El Kifl. I'm not a great one for going around and seeing relics, but what I saw there was the most incredible place ever. I saw the glory and the presence of God. And we read about these wills that Ezekiel saw. And as I went there, there they were. I could see these wills of glory. And Ezekiel's shrine was in an old oriental synagogue. There used to be over a million Jews in Iraq. It was the biggest Jewish community in the whole of the Middle East. Now, I still have Kiddush and lead the Pasha and the readings for the Jews in Iraq. Even the Passover seeds, I do them in the church. Do you know how many Jews we have left now? We have six Jews in the whole of Iraq. I I still am committed to those six Jews. Every Friday on the internet, 
on my Facebook page. You can like my Facebook page. You can't become my friend, no room. But you can like my public figure page. And every Friday, I do the Pasha for Shabbat, which is a reading of the Torah for the Sabbath, every week. And it's quite interesting that I have even been asked to go to some Orthodox synagogues and give the Pasha lesson in Hebrew for the Jewish community. I was at the synagogue in Liverpool the other day and Rabbi Ariel, he came to me and said, will you come and give us the Pasha in the synagogue? And I'm not going there to try and convert the Jews. I'm going there to try and love them. And one of my recent books is called The Older Younger Brother. And it's the story of the terrible things that Christians have done to Jews over 2,000 years. And it's horrendous. I cried and cried as I wrote that book. Usually I have lots of books after a talk. But I finish a two-week tour tonight and I've got 20 left, that's all. Only 20. Ashley, would you like to have a free book? Would you like one? I'm offering you a free book. Okay. Look, you haven't got to read it all. But your mummy will be able to tell you who all these people are. And you, I say you've only got to look at the pictures. Okay? I'll tell you who's on this page. That's John Major. That's Tony Blair. That's Tarek Aziz. That's Desmond Tutu. That's Richard Branson, and that's Yasser Arafat. They're all quite big people. And that is Justin Welby. So, I will sign it for you after. Okay? So, I tell you what. With your pen, it's very good reading books at night under your bed clothes when you go to bed when you go to bed you can get out your pen and read your book I do it yeah, I like that okay could you do one more thing for me you see all these people here they're quite a lot aren't they <coughs> Give somebody that one. <coughs> now. Choose that pen to go to somebody. There we are. So I really did not like Jordan. Jordan to me was the most boring country in the world. I used to go there from Jerusalem to Baghdad and one day Archbishop Justin said to me, Andrew, you're more use alive than dead. Leave now. Now, believe it or not, Bishop Antony will tell you this. I take Episcopal authority very seriously. I always obeyed you, Bishop, didn't I? <laughs> so I had to leave. And I went to Jordan. 
And I always say to my people, I will never leave you, don't you leave me. A lot of them left Baghdad because the violence was so bad and they went to Nineveh, their homeland where the Christians had come from. And Nineveh was a place where a really miserable evangelist went. 2,700 years ago, he went by submarine. <laughs> you know his name, don't you? Yeah. So he went by submarine. 2,700 years ago. All the people in Nineveh are now Assyrians. The Assyrians were the bad guys in Babylon. And Daniel and Ezekiel took God's message to them. And they all became followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And then after Martoma, St. Thomas, went through Iraq, from Palestine to Iraq, on his way to India, they all became Christian. Now, in Iraq, a Christian is called an Assyrian. So all of them are followers of Israel. So they started fleeing to Jordan and I never forget one family. There was a young boy called Mario and Mario said to me, Abuna, Abuna, my daddy got killed by ISIS just three weeks ago. Will you become my daddy now? I said, of course I'll become your daddy. And then he said to me, the one other thing I want is school. No Iraqi children were allowed to go to school in Jordan. Starting a school was a little more difficult. It took me three weeks. And now we have hundreds of children. And um, have we got any of our videos to show? Yeah, yeah we have. We have. Because our school, all the children wear a bow tie. <laughs> It's part of their uniform, is it? There they are. Every child wears a bow tie. Would you like to hear them sing the Lord's Prayer? They sing it three times every day. Abu Nevda Bashmaya. Let's hear it. So that gives you an idea of how central praying is to my children. And they stand there with their arms out to Jesus. And I went to speak to them in school the other day, literally only about six weeks ago. And I said, 
all of you play three times a day in the playground. I want you all to ask God for something. I said, when I was a student, the most important thing I remember from my days at Cambridge was Dr. Margaret Balker. She said, I'm going to teach you the most important lesson in your ministry. She said, every day, ask God for something. And next week when I'd see her in supervision, she'd say, what did you ask for this week? And when did you get it? And so, I asked the children, various children, what have you asked God for today? What have you asked God for? And I'll never forget what one little boy said to me. He said, Abuna, what I asked God for was a Burger King. <laughs> because I see the advert there every day but we could never get one. I said, God will give you one. The next day we had a picnic for the children and some American people came to visit us and they decided they wanted to buy a Burger King for all the children. And that little boy could not believe it. God answered his prayer, even for a Burger King. And God answers our prayers all the time. And I can remember so many occasions where I thought, what is happening? God promises to answer all of our needs according to his riches in glory. I was kidnapped one day, as you are, and I was thrown into a black, black room. And you know what, Ashley? This was before I had my pen. <laughs> so, if you were kidnapped and thrown into a black room now with a pen, I always have a pen in my pocket, it would be good. But I did have a satellite phone. It was no good in this room because there's no signal to the satellites. But I used the light. And in the middle of the night, I got my phone and looked around and over the floor were chopped off fingers and toes. I had gone to try and find some Brazilians who had been kidnapped and when I saw these fingers and toes I thought they're probably theirs. I never got them back. But these people who kidnapped me, they never actually removed my phone or removed the 500, the, no, the $50,000 I had in my waistband. In those days, I always kept $50,000 in my waistband just in case, you never know. So when they came in, I kind of started dealing with the bad guys in the way that you deal with bad guys. Yes, I'm here to help you. I know you need to liberate your country. If you let me go, I'll give you some money. 
I got out with just $50,000. Within a few weeks, people were costing $6 million and more. I remember two Italian girls that we were working on releasing and we did a deal to get them out and it was $30 million for each of them they wanted. Now the Italian government never paid ransoms but it kind of said to us, come on Andrew, how much is it? We'll give it to you. Just take it, do it for us. So we put $60 million in cash in the back of the car and got them. That was the nature of the kind of life. I didn't tell my bishop that I'd just done that. Did I, Bishop Anthony? But you probably knew anyway, didn't you? So um, it was an interesting life. There in our school in Jordan, in our school which is flourishing, I took across from Bethlehem. One of my good friends in Bethlehem is a carpenter in Bethlehem called Joseph. And he makes his crosses. So Joseph made these crosses and I took them to school. And I gave them to all the children. And I said, keep the cross in your pocket all the time. And one of the other boys at school also called Joseph said to me, Abuna, he started to cry, I wanted one for my daddy. But Dash, Isis killed my daddy two weeks ago. So I said, I will give you this cross for your daddy. And you must put it onto the altar. And one day your soul will come back and he will give your daddy his cross. Always before I go on a trip like this one, I go and see to the children, I'm going to go away for a couple of weeks now. What do you want me to say to the people? They always say the same thing. They say, tell them Jesus loves them. And then they start singing to me. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes! Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. But when I last went there, Yosef said to me, Will you take my cross and give it to them? I said, Yusuf, you keep your cross. I will get another cross and I will give it to somebody. Ashley, will you take Yusuf's cross? This is Joseph's cross. Oh, I...
so important. These are your brothers and your sisters. What do we need you to do? We need you to pray for peace and pay for peace. We can't do our work without your help. With your help, we can do everything. We run the school, we make them their bow ties, we give them food, we run a clinic for them. All of this total support we provide the housing is all because people pray and pay. Will you do that? We had a man coming one day, Ahmed. He came into the clinic and he said to the doctors, I want my daughter to be treated in the English clinic. Well, the clinic isn't English. Might be in the Anglican church, but the clinic has all Iraqi doctors. And I said, there's no way we can treat a t your daughter in the university hospital. So, I said to him, he was sent to me, they said, go to Abuna. I prayed with him. And I said to him, go to the hospital now and all the way there, just say, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. And then I said, Yeshua will make her better. He got to the hospital saying, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. And the doctor came out and said, Ahmed, I'm so sorry. Whilst you're away, your daughter died. She was so ill, she died. She cried and cried and cried. And he went to her in bed and held a body and said, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. She sat up and she said, Daddy, I'm hungry, can I have some food? So he came and told me this and said, don't worry, it's happened before. <laughs> I was talking to Mrs. Priddis today and she was telling me of some of the incredible miracles that they have seen right here of people who have been touched by the Holy Spirit. The Lord wants to reach out and touch us, to make us whole. But the most important thing is that we will love Yeshua. And Yeshua says to you, I love you, I love you, and I love you. Every one of our service starts with the words, al khub al khub al khub We love, love, and love. And Jesus loves you. Even if you don't know Jesus, maybe you came here to church tonight because somebody bombarded you and persuaded you to come. You know, these religious people, these Christian people, they do that kind of thing. 
But Jesus, he just loves you. And I'm not saying you've got to come down and kneel and confess your sins and know that he has forgiven you. I'm saying you've got to know right now that he loves you. And that we say at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. That is the message of tonight. Yes, I might be telling you how bad it is for so many of the persecuted Christians. The persecution of the church today is the worst it has ever been. And it's not just Iraq and Iran. Do you know where the worst persecution is today? Pakistan. Anybody here from Pakistan? So many people. Every day I hear of my brothers and sisters in Pakistan being persecuted for their faith. Of my people, I have had over 1,273 of my people killed. That's more than is in this congregation at the cathedral now. It's really embarrassing when you're filming in the midst of a service. And I wouldn't mind, but they don't speak English anyway. It is off now. It happened once when I was doing a funeral. The phone started to ring and people said, oh, maybe that was him talking to us. But God is talking to you all tonight. And he's saying, I love you. when we are faced with such terrible atrocities. All I can say to our people is we must love Jesus. Love him, love him, and love him. And say, I love you, Lord. And they do. ISIS turned up once to a father in the church in Mosul who had gone away. And ISIS said to him, you have got to say that you follow Islam and Muhammad is the greatest, otherwise we will kill your children. He phoned me that night, Abuna, Abuna, will Yeshua forgive me? <coughs> I said, what have you done? He said, they told me I had to say that I would follow Islam. And Muhammad was the greatest prophet, otherwise they would kill my children. I couldn't bear to see my children killed. I said it. I said, Yusuf, I would have done the same. Would you? Or are you so holy, you would have been like the people who they went to the next day. And the next day ISIS turned up and they went to the children not the parents. And they said, we want you to say you're going to follow Islam and Muhammad is the greatest, otherwise you're dead! And the children said, no, we love Yeshua. 
Every day Yeshua talks to us. Every day we talk to Yeshua. He killed them all. And there I was in Baghdad when this news came. And I just cried and cried and cried. And two of the little girls came to us, who are now in our school at Jordan. And they said, Daddy, don't cry. Because last night when we were asleep, we saw the man in white come and stand by us. That's what they refer to as the vision of Jesus. And he said they are now dancing in heaven with me. And so whenever these terrible things have happened, I've just held on to the fact that they are dancing in heaven with Jesus. And they are. And one day I will see them and they'll probably still be dancing. We see angels all the time. And in one or two of my books which are left, there are pictures of what we see when we see the angels. It's incredible. The Lord is here and his spirit is with us. Tonight the Lord will touch you. The Lord will preserve you. The Lord will surround you with his love, with his glory. This message tonight is not a depressed message. Yes, things might be bad for our people, our people, but God is so good. He can even give you a Burger King. And if God can give you a Burger King, he can give you anything. And tonight, we all need life. I'm not going to preach on and on to you, because most of you have got life. And you know what Yeshua is to you. I wish I could tell you a great story of how I was saved. I can't. Sorry. Because I've never been converted. From a young child, my father taught me that Jesus loves you and you must love him. And I always have. I've never doubted him one day, not even when I was at Cambridge, which is quite a miracle. Who's always loved Jesus? I'm sure I'm not the only one who's not saved. We're all saved, but some of us haven't had a conversion experience. But the Lord is here, and his Spirit is with us. I want to pray God's blessing again. And I know that God wants to restore every one of us. He wants to bring us closer to him. 
He wants us to heal him. He wants us to be restored by him. I feel very strongly that there are some people that God wants to heal tonight and in particular it's somebody with retinitis pigmentosa a retinal condition in the eye and there are also four people with very unpleasant, myaldic encephalomyelitis or fibromyalgia that God wants to touch. Reach out and touch him and he will touch you. Bismillah, we live in Warwick, Al Qudus, Allah, 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 Amen. Thank you, Lord, that you have met us in the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I forgot to tell you something. This here is the actual Bible that belonged to Smith Wigglesworth. And it's falling to pieces, but it's a very powerful reminder to me of the power of God. Wherever I go, in whatever situation, this is one of the founders of the modern Pentecostal movement and this reminds me that I'm not alone. I'm doing it in the power of God. Bye!